Shall we pray together this opening prayer? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are going to sing together. Would you please stand as we sing all people that on earth do dwell. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us repent of our sins and turn to Christ. Together we pray. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. We're going to declare the praises of our merciful and loving Heavenly Father in the words of this canticle of Psalm 103. Would you perhaps please stand as we say these words together? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with faithful love and compassion, who satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And so we will sing again, the Lord's my shepherd.
Could you please be seated for our reading? And Marjorie is going to read for us. Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Marjorie. This is the season of um, New Year's, New Year's resolutions and new beginnings. And um, I think it raises an interesting question in terms of our life of faith, our life as the people of God. What's the goal? What's the objective? What are we aspiring to in the year to come? You could say, what's the point of all of this? Why do we gather week by week? Why do we read our Bibles and why do we pray? If I think back over my life of faith, I probably would have answered that question in different ways looking back and so for example i think probably my first motivation was the, that i wanted to be a better person i wanted to be more than i was i looked at the life that i lived and i thought this isn't all it should be i wanted to be more in terms of who i was and the way that i lived and i think that's a good aspiration um, i hope that the life of faith is transformative but i'm not sure that that's the goal I'm not sure, I think that's more a sort of a, a fruit of what we do rather than the objective in itself. And certainly the saints who've gone before us would say that the more they went on, the more aware they were of their faults. We never stopped being a sinner. So that's possible. Perhaps a, a, a better um, explanation might have been uh, uh, that we want to understand more who God is that uh, we want to understand better the truth about God. And that's a really good aspiration. The truth will set you free. In the midst of all of the kind of confusion of life, the Christian faith offers a way of understanding and making sense of who we are in the world and who God is, which is absolutely astonishing. It's a good aspiration. But um, again, I think that might not be the, the primary thing. If I look at a different stage in my life, I might have said it was all about challenging the injustices of society, that there's a kind of activist part of what it means to be Christian. And of course, that's a really good and important thing. But I, I guess my experience would be that without something to underpin that, it's just exhausting and overwhelming, and we will be burnt out by all, you know, all that there is that's wrong with this world. Um, here is how I would answer it now. John's Gospel says, now this, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And I would say that the goal of all of this is to know God, to know him for ourselves. And it's really interesting in that verse in John's gospel that Jesus talks about this is eternal life, that this is, of course, the experience of heaven, but that it's to be experienced now, that we can catch a glimpse of eternity because we can know God now. It's an amazing thing that we can do, that something of God, we can taste and see that he is good. I love that moment in um, uh, the Genesis story before the fall when Adam and Eve are walking in the garden in the cool of the day and God walks with them. I've always loved that picture. And it's as if that's the thing which is being restored through all of this. And um, knowing God is a taste of heaven. And I think that's what the goal is. I think that's what they saw, what the disciples saw in Jesus. Um, when they looked at his life, when they, you know, they, they walked closely with him, they saw how he lived and they saw how he prayed and they saw the kind of the quality and the richness of Jesus' relationship with God and his life of prayer and the way that he sort of lived in the light of eternity all the time. And they asked him a question. They said, Lord, teach us to pray like you do. And the answer that he gave to that question was this prayer that we're looking at tonight. It's, um, it's an amazing, rich, and wonderful prayer. But before we look at it, I think I just want to make this observation. We have to learn to pray. And I think it's a journey which is always ongoing. We have to be learning we have to be schooled in prayer. You note that what Jesus did at the start of the reading was he was quite critical of how some people pray. He was saying, listen, some people pray just for show. Some people pray just to kind of look like they're kind of religious and important. Other people pray like to twist God's arm in order to try and get something. Don't be like that. This is how you should pray. Do you see that Jesus is kind of critiquing the prayer of those people and saying, no, 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 there are better ways to pray, to pray. We need to be learning to pray. And the way that he teaches us is by giving us this most famous, most familiar, but really very remarkable prayer. It's remarkable, I think, because of its simplicity. C.S. Lewis once said, if you can't explain something simply, you probably haven't understood it. And um, Jesus sums up a, a a subject as vast and wonderful as prayer in this incredibly succinct way. It's, um, uh, it's so memorable. It has this memorable quality to it, which is kind of part of how um, the, the kind of rhythm and the poetry of it. It's amazing the way that it's still well known within society. You know this, I'm sure, but if you go to a funeral and it's not particularly a Christian funeral, and yet the minister says, shall we pray the Lord's Prayer? People join in. It's still there in people's, um, in that kind of, it's a sort of, uh, it, there's almost a relic of Christianity is, is still there. I've been in situations with great crowds of people who I wouldn't expect who still know the Lord's Prayer. There's something amazing about it. And um, yes, it's got this sort of lovely rhythm and cadence to it. It's kind of got these recurring images and figures of speech. It's clearly very carefully crafted. And I don't know when Jesus did that, but I sort of imagine him in the wilderness, sort of working on a prayer which summed up all that was important to him and was easy to be learned and memorized. And so if it is carefully crafted by Jesus, he's done that for you. This is the prayer that Jesus teaches. And it's a prayer for us sort of to take on, to allow to shape who we are. Now I say it's simple, and it is. It's simple enough for a child to learn because children often do learn it, but it's also bigger than we can imagine. Um, the scope of this prayer is vast. It's, it's heaven and earth. It's um, eternity. It's astonishing in its scale. And I think 
through the Lord's Prayer, we are drawn into something much bigger than ourselves. We're drawn into the sort of grand narrative, the big story of God's purposes in the world. And as such, it kind of calls us to grow up in our prayers. I think if Jesus had a criticism, maybe too often our prayers are quite small. And that's okay at a, st a certain stage, um, like the prayers of a child are often quite small. But the Lord's Prayer calls us to grow, into, grow up into something bigger. It's almost like sort of dressing up in grown-ups clothes that are a little bit too big for us. But then as we do so, we stand a little taller and we find that we start to grow into them. It is an insight into the heart of who Jesus is and what is important to him. It sums up, yes, with beautiful simplicity, but with incredible sort of richness, the way that Jesus understood what it meant to be in the purposes of God. The, the way that Jesus understood what it meant to be God's people in the world. I think it's a, a wonderful summary of what Jesus is about. And if you, know, if you find Christianity complicated sometimes, and it is, this is a, a wonderful summary. If you needed to kind of write on the back of an envelope what Christianity was about, you could do a lot worse than simply write out the Lord's Prayer. It is a prayer which draws us into the presence and purposes of God. Because it's a prayer to be prayed, as we often do, and I'm going to be encouraging us to do that. But it's also a pattern of prayer. It also shows us how to pray. You know what I mean? It's sort of a, a recipe which draws us more richly into prayer. I feel like it's a little bit like tuning into God. That's a picture. You remember the old radios? Some of you may still have them, where you have to turn the dial, and you, it's just static. And then suddenly the static will break, and you'll start to hear the music. And uh, I feel like for much of our life, we're surrounded by static. There's so much noise that comes at us all the time. And what this prayer does is just helps us to tune in to the rich and wonderful music of God. This prayer is um, a duty, I think. It is a, a prayer that we are called to pray. Jesus says, pray this prayer. And uh, it's right that we take that duty on. One of the things I'm going to suggest is that we should pray this prayer every day. Find a, a moment at the beginning or the end of the day and simply and quietly pray this prayer. It is a duty, but also it is a privilege. And this is a prayer which is really good for you. That by praying this prayer, something just changes little by little. And I think I could say with great confidence that if you were to pray this prayer every day, you would be changed by it and changed for the better. It's a, a duty, but it's also a privilege. And uh, in this prayer, we find that we are, are, are tuned in to who God is and we find something of his peace and his comfort. This kind of prayer, I think... I realize is the sort of the neglected jewel of the life of faith. I think um, probably as a young man, I was far more interested in the knowing and the doing and prayer didn't come easily to me. And it's only been as the years have gone on that I've realized that actually this isn't a nice extra. This is the thing. This is the thing which underpins everything else. It's the foundation of the life of faith. As I say, it's um, a prayer to be prayed, but it's also a pattern of prayer. And we're going to sort of be exploring that in the coming weeks, because I think this is a, a, a form of prayer which um, well helps us to understand who we are as well. Um, I think we're made for this relationship with God. You know, but there's a lovely old Augustine quote which says, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. I think this is one of the ways by which we find that rest in God. We find the kind of clarity and perspective and understanding that the presence of God offers. But it is, of course, also a call to action. It's very difficult to pray this prayer without setting our sights on all that's wrong with the world. 
Uh, and prayer is one of the ways in which we join in with what God is doing in the world. There's this astonishing way in which kind of um, God acts in response to the prayers of his people. When something needs to be done, he raises up people to pray for it. And this is a prayer which cries out for justice, for food, for the hungry, for forgiveness and mercy, for deliverance for the oppressed. And um, it couldn't be more pertinent, more relevant in today's world. So that our actions and our desires, desires and the things that we uh, long for are fueled by prayer. So my aspiration for us in this new year is that we learn once more to pray, to learn to pray in new ways, to put on kind of bigger clothes of prayer, uh, to take faltering steps into a new world of prayer, a world which is bigger than we can imagine, uh, more significant and more important. And as I say, over the coming weeks, we're going to be kind of exploring this prayer and, and, and seeing it afresh, um, uh, dusting off the familiarity and seeing the richness that it has to offer, reclaiming it, if you like, and allowing it to frame our thinking and shape our life of prayer. As I said, it would be wonderful if you would join with me to commit to praying this every day. Is that something you'd be able to do? I promise you, it will change you. So over these coming weeks, let's do that. And as we sort of look at a little piece of it every week, um, we will understand it better. We will pray it more um, uh, with more understanding and uh, we will be tuned in to who God is and what he's doing in the world. And I think that is a wonderful hope. Let's end, shall we, by praying it together. Um, Guy, can we bring it up on screen? Let's pray this prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Should we just be still for a moment? We're going to pray briefly for our world and our church and our community, but let's just kind of hold all of those things in the light of this prayer that Jesus taught. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our world. We think in the stillness of all of those places of darkness and fear and violence. Lord, may your kingdom of peace come in those places. May your will of love and grace be done in those places on earth as it is in heaven father we think of all places of poverty and want in this world we think of those communities and nations where there's never enough where food is always a source of anxiety I think too of the privilege we have of living in a, a comfortable and wealthy nation. Lord, we pray for justice in this world, for generosity of spirit, a willingness to share and to address the problems which cause injustice and inequality. And Father, we pray you forgive us our sins and the sins of our society and our nation. 
Lord, may we long for a better world. May we long to be better people. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing once more and this next hymn is our offertory hymn. And then we're going to prepare to gather around the communion table and break bread and share wine together. Would you please stand as we sing, make me a channel of your peace. As we prepare to gather around this holy table, let us pray together this prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made this world and you love your creation. You gave your son, Jesus Christ, to be our saviour. 
his dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his commands, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did in him. We plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favor on your people, gather us into your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven through Christ and with Christ and in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. Eat in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Would you please stand for our closing hymn, O love that will not let me go. And so we close our worship this evening with this wonderful Northumbrian blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.